Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a leadership development podcast told through the lens of Star Trek. And now here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Once again, Dr. Pulaski shines through for us. We'll talk about her thoughts on failure as a teacher, and we'll also ask the age-old question, did Picard mess this one up? Let's do it as we dive into the third episode of TNG's second season. It's elementary, dear Data. The base reason for this entire episode is that, well, <laughs> space travel can be pretty boring sometimes. Uh, getting kind of bored. Ah. As viewers, we see snippets of the whole life of these characters, and what this episode shows us is what they do in their free time. The Enterprise arrived at its rendezvous three days early. They're going to be meeting up with the USS Victory. That's a Constellation-class starship that Geordi LaForge was assigned to as an ensign. As a gift to his former commanding officer, Geordi has put together a replica model of the HMS Victory from the early 19th century. And after showing that off to Data, he has a surprise for him, too. They're going to go to the holodeck to play along with some Sherlock Holmes. It can be reached at 221 B Baker Street. A holodeck adventure. (laughs) What could go wrong? Right? Well, well, let's see. Data's really impressed with the holodeck's reproduction of the setting. He takes Geordi on a, on a short tour of all the trinkets, the books and stuff that are in the, in the room they start off in. Really, he's, he's a lot like I was when I was walking through the Star Trek exhibit at the Experience Music Project in Seattle. He purchased this in a pawn shop in Tottenham Court Road for 55 shillings. We get one of our early glimpses into Data's passion for music and his ability to, to just, you know, throw himself into a character based on all of the data that he's consumed. That's incredible. How can you play it like that? Data's desire to be a creative is an ongoing theme throughout the next generation. And these are some of the early seeds for that development. As they're playing along, you know, having a good time, Inspector Lestrade and a partner come to the door. The inspector describes a crime that was perpetrated against his partner. Data walks up, reaches right into the victim's coat pocket and immediately just solves the crime. Just like that. In the middle of him explaining, You will deduce says did I the computer freeze program. Jordy just shuts it down. He walks out. He says that playing Sherlock Holmes with Data, <laughs> it's like it's like playing Knights of the Old Republic with, with, with me. You know, somebody who's beaten it at least 19 times already. There's no more mystery. There's no more surprise. And, and according to Jordy, there's, there's no fun. You know, you just jump to the cool part. You skip out on the work that according to LaForge. If there's no mystery, there's no game. No game, no fun. They're having this conversation in 10 forward. And Dr. Pulaski overhears and she chimes in. Now, we've only watched one episode with Pulaski in it. And, and we haven't, well, we haven't really yet touched on her mm, aversion. To data. Okay, clank it. You see, she sees him as just nothing more than, than a, a, a computer, you know, a, a tool to be used, where the rest of the crew, they see him as, as, as one of them. She says, Saying that to data is asking a computer not to compute. And goes on to say, And where's the victory in winning a battle you can't possibly lose? And then we hit it. We hit on what might be one of life's biggest and most valuable lessons. Are you suggesting there is some value in losing? Yes. Yes, that's the great teacher. We're going to talk a lot about this when we get to the command codes. But what she does after this is just as great, too. She challenges Data to solve a Holmes mystery that he hasn't already read and that he doesn't already have the solution for. And she's willing to put her theory to the test. See, she believes beyond any shadow of a doubt that Data just simply isn't capable of deductive reasoning on his own. That that he can only recite, memorize, and and learn by rote. So Jordy and Data have the computer write a mystery in the Holmes style. And the three of them head into the holodeck to see how Data does as Sherlock Holmes. And you, madam, are invited to be a witness. I wouldn't miss it. Well, it seems that AI writing is still still pretty flawed in the 24th century. 
See, data data solves the mystery after just a few minutes because the computer just took a couple aspects of a few home stories and just, you know, hodgepodge them together. Data picked up on the clues, put the pieces together, and solved the crime. Pulaski cries. Fraud, inspiration, original thought, all the true strength of homes. It's not possible for our friend. Jordy's not going to be deterred, though. And Data, Data's super eager to prove his ability. So, so, so Jordy, <laughs> Jordy goes for it. Computer, in the Holmesian style, create a mystery to confound Data with an opponent who has the ability to defeat him. Like I said earlier, it's the holodeck, right? What could go wrong? Hmm. Well, in an unintentionally hilarious cut, we go straight to Worf and Riker on the bridge who see... An odd surge of power, sir. All right, move on! Nothing to see here! And then we cut back to the holodeck. <laughs> the game, as they say, is afoot. The trio strolls through London, innocently looking about. We see Professor Moriarty standing in an alley, and he says... I feel like a new man. And then he does the unthinkable. He calls for the arch and, and it actually appears. Now, for those that don't constantly consume Star Trek like I do, saying arch on the holodeck causes the doorway to appear so you, so you can interface with the computer. And yeah, that means Moriarty has access to the ship's computer. Hmm. Looks like we've got our opponent. As the three are strolling about, Pulaski is abducted. Jordy thinks she's playing a joke on them, but Data, examining the footprints in the dirt, is able to see that two men snatched her. And then he gives very specific details about the people based on the movements that he can see in the footprints. There's, some, there's actually some pretty great deductive reasoning going on here. Jordy smiles. He's into the game now. And Data is rocking this. He's explaining his reasoning to Jordy, who's, who's kind of struggling to follow along. So Data drops character and, and walks him through it, but then falls right back into character as he wraps it up. Deduction. Pure and simple. Well, not that simple. I've got to believe that Brent Spiner had a blast on this episode. After a long pursuit, they end up in Moriarty's lab, and he's been smartened up to the whole gimmick. Welcome, my dear Holmes, but not Holmes. And Dr. Watson, but not Watson. He hands Data a drawing, and Data immediately just storms away, exits the holodeck. He tries to shut down the program, but he can't. He's freaked out. Nothing that is going on here should be happening or, or even be possible. On their, way, on their way to inform Picard and the senior crew, Data shares the drawing with Geordi. Moriarty drew the Enterprise. Did it wait? What about the doctor? Is she all right in there? No. She is in grave danger. Worf, Troy, and Riker join Picard, Geordi, and Data in the observation lounge. They realize that Geordi's instructions to create an opponent that could defeat Data and not just Sherlock Holmes, that's the key. He said Data, not Sherlock Holmes. That's what caused all of this. And what's more, Troy senses a... Unifying force or a single consciousness is trying to bring it all into focus. And that suggests Moriarty has become sentient. It's alive! The ship starts rocking. Looks like Moriarty can physically control it. Picard decides to accompany Geordi and Data back to the holodeck with Worf and security prepared to come in if, if they're needed. In his lab, Moriarty's visiting with Pulaski. She is supremely confident that this is all just, you know, a holodeck program. She's totally safe. Well, that is until he calls for the arch again. She has to leave and invites him to join her, which, which is so brilliant. See, what you know, and what I know, and that Moriarty might not know, is that if he does step out of the holodeck, he'll just disappear. He needs the emitters in there to exist. But he politely declines and explains that Pulaski is just bait for Jean-Luc Picard. In a top hat and tuxedo, Picard joins Data in London. They note the holographic images are changing. They're more realistic. They're more dangerous. Moriarty's altering the program all on his own. They make their way to the lab and are greeted by an expecting Moriarty and a really uncomfortable Pulaski. You all right? Yes, except for being crammed full of crumpets. Moriarty shows that he controls the ship and that while he's civilized, he's still dangerous. 
They attempt to run the program to its conclusion, you know, hoping that that will end it. So Data just admits defeat. But Moriarty doesn't accept, and the program persists. He lays out more threats, so Picard, Picard just agrees with him and gets to the heart of the matter. Yes, you can do that. But what is it you want? Let's dive into this real quick, because this is an incredible technique that Chris Voss talks about in his book, Never Split the Difference. Instead of just arguing points that don't don't really matter, just, you know, just give them to your opponent and then get to what matters. You can find Voss's book and dive into this. There's a lot of other great reads, too, on the reading list at jeffaken.com. I strongly suggest you check this book out. Moriarty says he wants to continue to exist. He wants to live. Picard explains that, well, while this is kind of possible, technology just just isn't to a point where he can exist anywhere outside of the holodeck. They dive into a short but, but, but important philosophical discussion. Is the definition of life cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. That does quite a bit to shift Picard's thinking. Moriarty makes a compelling case that, that he's alive and conscious. Disassemble! Dead! But he acknowledges that, yeah, there's technological barriers. Because he acknowledges that, they're able to find, find common ground. I do not want to die. And I do not want to kill you. This common ground does what common ground allows for. A mutually beneficial solution, or in this case, uh, a compromise. Moriarty gives up control of the ship. Then they agree to store his consciousness in the Enterprise's memory banks until there's a way to bring him back. Pulaski says it might be a really long time until the technology exists, but but he shows his admiration and respect for her by saying, But I'll still fill you with crumpets. Picard then saves his program and ends the holodeck program. Back in engineering, Picard checks out Geordi's model of the victory. They talk about the ship and the situation. Geordi's blaming himself for the danger that the ship was in, but Picard sets him at ease. Everything in perfect order, as are we, Mr. LaForge. Just as the victory arrives for the rendezvous. <coughs> this episode had some pretty pretty serious holes in it, but all in all, this was a lot of fun. Cut the cuts, cuts is fun, come right now, don't walk, run! Hi there, cadets. In our last episode, where we watched Discovery's Choose Your Pain, we talked about the incredible performance review that Saru set up for himself. Well, I created a tool to help you do the same thing for yourself. For your free copy of this tool, visit jeffaken.com and join our mailing list. You'll get access to a copy that you can download for yourself and for your team. Just visit jeffaken.com and join the mailing list. Thanks. I kind of hated that Picard had to swoop in and save the day at the end. Here I come to save the day. And there really wasn't any resolution to Pulaski's accusations that Data wasn't capable of solving a unique mystery. But but aside from that, we did learn a lot about the holodeck technology itself. This is no larger than the holodeck, of course. So the computer adjusts by placing images of more distant perspective on the holodeck walls. And how it's similar to the tech behind transporters. Also, this is the tech behind replicators. So if there's any scientists out there listening today or that you know anybody, make sure they are hyper-focused on figuring that tech out. The acting in this episode was great. Spiner's Holmes was, was a little over the top, but that's totally what it should have been given the context. And I, I like that they even addressed that when LaForge was like, Data, do Holmes really talk like that? Absolutely. But... But Spiner's ability to slide between Holmes and Data was was near perfect and really added to the reality of the situation. Like, if you were there and everything was just going south, you'd probably drop out of character too. Until you couldn't because that might be giving too much away, right? Now, I haven't watched any of the new Sherlock Holmes stuff that's been out there, like Robert Downey Jr.'s or Johnny Lee Miller's or even Khan's. I mean... <laughs> I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch's. The name's Sherlock Holmes, and the address is 221B Baker Street. But I'd be hard-pressed to see a better Moriarty than Daniel Davis gives us. I believed every single thing that he did, every word he said. When he told Pulaski that he was to be feared, oh, that was bone-chilling. His has got to be one of the top guest appearances in Star Trek. 
And even though we only got a few minutes of Pulaski in this one, I think she's amazing. We'll, we will absolutely get some episodes with her where her attitude towards Data gets way past uncomfortable, all the way to inappropriate. But, but we just see hints of that in this one. But in this one, her cool confidence, her ability to play along and to challenge assumptions and challenge the status quo without being, without being a jerk, it's fantastic. And this episode also demonstrated a concept that may have been well ahead of its time. And that's, and that's how difficult it can be for a person that is neurodivergent to conform to the unwritten rules of society or the workplace. See, in the beginning of the episode, Jordy's frustrated and angry with Data because he just solved the mystery, remember? The, the back and forth between them about it is really telling. You see, I was looking forward to the mystery. Then I should have extended the sequence of events. Oh, I'm not getting through. See, Data isn't wrong. Like, the point of the game was to solve the mystery, but, but Jordy wasn't wrong either. To a person that is a strictly literal thinker, like Data, or some people that are neurodivergent or on the autism spectrum, this can be wildly confusing. I recently attended APSI's national conference. APSI is the Association of People Supporting Employment First, a group in the United States focused on facilitating the full inclusion of people with disabilities in the workplace and the community. There was a presentation by a speaker I've seen before and, and always learn from, Bev Harp from the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. Her presentation was about the secret rule book and unspoken expectations at work. In there, she uses the example of a, of a two-headed llama. One head is told to go solve the mystery while the other head is told to take time and problem solve and enjoy the process. To a person that is neurotypical or whose neurodivergence works in a different way, they can look at that as an and statement, right? Solve the mystery and take your time to problem solve and enjoy the process. To many people that are neurodivergent, though, it's an either or statement. You either solve the mystery or or you take your time. This little scene beautifully demonstrated this way of thinking. The takeaway for us is that we interact with people that struggle with their inner two-headed llama all the time. They just work really hard to cover it up. So try to be more patient, more understanding. Like, have the discussion that Jordy did with Data, but don't blow up and storm out of the room like he did. And if you ever have a chance to hear Bev speak, please do. Like, I'm not doing her justice here, and hers is a message that everyone can benefit from. I think I've shared that I've kind of avoided the first two seasons of TNG for a long time. One of my complaints was Pulaski. But watching this show when it was first airing, she, see, she just never clicked for me. But watching it now with a more critical eye, so far, so far I'm a huge fan. Command codes verified. This episode was focused on the mystery put in front of Data and kept us in the moment almost the entire time. But the lessons we learned from Picard and Pulaski here are great. Pulaski talks about the value of losing and the value of failure, while Picard misses out on an opportunity for development and growth. But did he miss it because missing it was the right thing to do? The Starfleet Leadership Academy is supported by listeners just like you. Click the link in the show notes to support the ongoing production of this podcast. Pulaski just nails it in this episode. She asks, where's the value in winning a battle that there's no chance of losing? And that's brilliant. That's deep. How do you look at failure specifically? Specifically, how do you look at your own failure? And how do you look at the failures of your team? I bring them up separately because they are two different things, but you should look at them the same. Your failure isn't any less good or bad than the failures of your team and vice versa. I've learned in talking with other leaders that there's, there's this sort of toxic self-accountability out there. 
like a leader will say, it's okay for their team to fail, you know, your colleagues to fail. In fact, I, I encourage it. But you hold yourself to a higher standard and you just, just won't tolerate your own personal failures. Well, newsflash, you're not actually holding yourself to a higher standard. You're needlessly beating yourself up and holding yourself back from growing and developing. Let me reset a little bit here. I've made I've made a huge assumption that we all look at failure in, in, in the macro sense the same way. You know that that failure is a good thing, right? I mean, Pulaski just just out and says it. We humans learn more often from from a failure or a mistake than we do from an easy success. So let's reset the table. Failure is a step towards success. Period. And more than that, failing means you're trying things that are new or outside of your comfort zone. And, and those are both awesome. There are so many incredible quotes from so many incredibly successful people about failure that, that you've got to believe there's something to this, right? Robert F. Kennedy said, Only those who dare to fail greatly can achieve greatly. Gina Showalter says, Giving up is the only sure way to fail. Thomas Edison's famous, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And, and what might be my favorite, which I, I, think, I think might be from Andy Warhol, if you're not failing, you're not trying. But if failure is so great, why do we go to such lengths to avoid it? Or worse, cover it up. I've spoken about the big IT upgrade, the accounting upgrade I was part of a few years ago, I think. Oof. And that project did not go well in a lot of ways. But what is still amazing to me is that our top leadership truly believed everything was just going great. And that's when I learned about and realized that I worked in a culture of never fail. My teams were in the thick of it, and it was an absolute dumpster fire, but the project leadership would spin those failures to sound like a success. And, but that spinning wasn't, wasn't done in a good way. Like, like a good way would have been to say something like we're falling behind on our project schedule because we just can't get enough people to dedicate their time to testing the system. Right. If you've ever been on an IT project, you've been there, right? That's a huge allocation of time. But instead they'd say, Oh yeah, things are going great. People are spending a lot of time testing. I mean, they're even testing more than, than we had planned, but we're making sure the system, the system's going to be ready for anything. The reality was that the testing needed eh, 12, maybe or so full-time people dedicated to it. And I think, I think we had four, they covered that up and we were never able to get the resources we need because they didn't want anyone to think they could possibly be failing. Now, when I had this realization and I brought it up with my leadership, they were able to reflect on other projects and saw that this had always been the way things had gone. Even when things were falling apart, they'd been made to believe that, hey, it's all good. But uh, everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? A never fail culture leads to poorly executed projects, low quality work products and disengaged employees period, full stop. Instead, everyone, organizationally, individually, need to embrace failure. Failure is so valuable and amazing if you learn from it. Failing and giving up, that's true failure. Failing and doing the same thing again, but expecting a different result, well, yeah, there's a, there's a definition for that too. But failing, Learning from that failure and changing your approach, oh, that is how you do amazing things. But Jeff, you say, I run a nuclear power plant, and failure there means the prologue to Fallout 3. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, there are absolutely things in which we cannot fail, but those, those are the exception. Those are very rare. So here's an exercise that I want you to do. In fact, here's your homework. Do this exercise and then share your ahas in the Starfleet Leadership Academy Facebook group. This exercise completely transformed the management culture of one of my teams. And I, I want to hear if it can do the same thing for you. Plus, others in the group will learn so much from what you learn too. Okay, here's the exercise. 
list three categories, critical, urgent, and routine. And then think of all the things that happen or could happen in your office, program, area, organization, you know, whatever it is, depending on your span of control. And then place those tasks or things in the appropriate category. So critical means that you need to respond right now, immediately, or catastrophic things could happen. Urgent means you need to take action or respond within like, you know, 12 hours, maybe a day. And routine is just what it sounds like, you know, the the things you can respond to within a few days, maybe a week or so. Now, can I give away just a little bit of the ending of this for you? See, I've been able to go through this exercise with a number of organizations in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, and almost all of them had one thing in common. And that one thing is that nothing was critical. Let me say that again. Nothing was critical. What? Now, if you're the nuclear power plant person I mentioned, or you work in healthcare, disaster response, infrastructure, or public safety, yeah, there are there are absolutely critical items. There are certainly sectors and industries that have critical response needs, but but th- none of them are surprising. Now, the other thing that this exercise assumes, and this might be a big one, but that's that you are brutally honest with yourself and your team. Like is that thing really critical? Is it? Like, if you waited four hours to respond, would anyone die? Would any critical information be compromised? And when I say compromised, I don't mean just be at risk, but but like actually be compromised. If you're being brutally honest, you're going to find that almost nothing is truly critical. Now, don't hear me wrong here. This does not mean that it's not important. Your work can absolutely be important, but not necessarily critical in the, the, the scope of this exercise. Just because something is put in a category other than critical, that does not mean it is not important. That has to be clear. It just means that you have some time before you need to respond to it. This is not a reflection on the importance of the work. And what this enables is really pretty powerful. Once you know something is urgent or or that most things are routine, failure becomes totally okay. You or your team or your organization can fail, fix the problem, learn from it, and ultimately become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. So do the exercise. This should not be easy. There should be some heated discussion and there should even be some times that you need to check your ego. But once you do it, you'll see that it's okay. It is totally safe and okay to encourage failure. So let's look back at that toxic self-awareness I brought up earlier. The world is catching on with this whole failure thing, finally. So so a lot of leaders and managers are, at best, encouraging failure. And close to worse, they're, they're tolerating it. Yes, there are still some that punish failure and, well... If you are one of those, or you know one, I'd ask you to invite them to listen to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, right? Or or just introduce them to me. I would love to find out why they think failure is a bad thing that should have negative consequences. But people that range from encouraging to tolerating for their teams, well, they might not still accept their own personal failures, They hold it against themselves, thinking that this is a way to encourage their development, thinking they're holding themselves to a higher standard. If this is you, stop. Knock it off. You are actively depriving yourself of the ability to grow and develop. If you're doing it, stop it. You know what I do when I fail? I breathe. Because... (laughs) Because I always fail. So that that keeps me alive, right? (laughs) But seriously, when I fail, personally, I take a breath. And then I look at what happened. Maybe maybe I reach out to people that I trust, uh, talk through it with them. This approach, by the way, is exactly how you should handle failures on your team, too. But we we look at what went well and what didn't go well. Where did I say the wrong thing to the wrong person? Or or when did I send the wrong info? Ask these questions. And, and, and again, be brutally honest with yourself. Remember, you're not beating yourself up. 
you're reflecting honestly on what happened so so you can learn and you can change your approach. A lot of people find success and value in journaling through this process, writing down the good and the bad and identifying what to continue doing and, and what to try differently. And if that's not your jam, hey, that's cool too. Find, find what works for you. But whatever you do, embrace failure as an essential step towards growth and success. And speaking of failure, ah, oh Jean-Luc, what were you doing? Data and Jordy came to you looking for guidance and help. Instead, you swooped in and saved the day yourself. Here I come to save the day. Quite masterfully, really. I mean, I loved how he used Chris Voss's technique of agreeing with Moriarty so they could focus on a solution. But was this a missed opportunity? Could he have coached Data on how to deal with Moriarty? Could, could they at least have brought Jordy along so he could have learned too? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say Picard made the right choice here. Now, a leader should use every possible opportunity to let someone else be the one to save the day. They should be behind them, supporting and coaching them. The tools and experience Data could have gained from this are massive, but... I think the stakes were too high. Earlier, we talked about the critical, urgent, and routine exercise, right? Well, on top of those are, are wildly unexpected and critical. They are things that come up that your training doesn't cover, that your day-to-day -day doesn't prepare you for, and, and where the price of failure is catastrophe. Now, while he didn't outright say it, it was implied that Moriarty could have destroyed Enterprise, killing everyone on board. In those situations, the leaders that are right for the job need to step in, and, and that's what Picard did. But let's add seven minutes to the episode if we could. In fact, we could pull out the scene of the murder victim that Data determines isn't part of the case, and, and that I totally skipped over in the recap because it doesn't really add anything to the story other than another example of Data using deductive reasoning, which, which they never revisited with Pulaski anyway, so, so really there was no, no reason for it at all. So let's drop that scene and add a few minutes to the end, just, you know, just for our benefit. It's the Starfleet Leadership Academy cut of elementary Dear Data. So the crisis is averted. Picard has touched base with Geordi down in engineering, and now Picard and Data are in his ready room. Data is standing because, well, be because he's Data, and Picard, sitting at his terminal with a half-drunk glass of Earl Grey tea, not so hot anymore, is questioning Data. Did you see how I asked him open-ended questions about his motivations? Yes, I did. Why do you think I did that? And on and on and on. See, walk through and review the incident with Data so he can still learn from it. So ideally, right, perfect case, Data is the one doing the negotiation with Picard having prepped and coached him. That's where the most learning could possibly happen. Next, next down the line, is what we're describing here in our bonus scene. Let Picard, who is perfectly suited for this situation, solve the problem, but but then recap it with data. To really be sure he's learning, benefiting from this though, Picard can't lecture. He has to ask open-ended questions about what data observed so he can walk himself through the thought processes. Picard can then add insights or describe what he was thinking in a moment to build on data's understanding. The next level down in learning is, is, is what we saw. Picard saves the day, data watches, no follow-up. And the worst situation would have been for Picard to have gone in by himself and, and just handled it. So, so I'm going to assume the after-action meeting occurred with data, and he's learned all sorts of great stuff from this experience. Point being, though, if possible, you should coach and prep others to stand in and solve problems. This not only teaches them invaluable lessons, but also builds their confidence. So when they don't have someone to prep or coach them, they're good to go. Or better yet, they're the one prepping and coaching someone else to do it. Just imagine your whole team trained, equipped, and experienced enough to handle any problem that comes your way. <laughs> You'd be invincible. And all you have to do is empower 
and enable others to save the day. Okay, you've got your homework. Categorize your work tasks into critical, urgent, or routine, and then share your learnings in our Facebook group. The link, the link is in the show notes. And you don't have to wait for that. You can always reach out on the socials. We're on Twitter at SFLA Podcast. And you can follow me on all the social media at Jeff T. Aiken. Jeff T, as in T and crumpets, A K I N. Computer, what are we going to watch next time? Working. Heading to the fourth season of Voyager, episode 14, Message in a Bottle. We meet the, um, kind of maybe controversial EMH Mark II in one of Star Trek's attempts at a comedic episode. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. But until then, ex astra scientia. 